My name's James, James Martin. And I formed the Martin School at Oxford, which is looking at the big problems and the big opportunities of the future and getting the most brilliant researchers to find solutions to those problems. And so I'm very interested in the future, its difficulties, its solutions, how you pull all of those together. And it's very clear to me that we can, we're, we're capable of creating a future which is enormously better than the present, the present that we live in today. And what, what I'm doing is trying to make that happen, as far as one person can. Humanity is drifting into a time where there's a great insecurity, because the population is growing too large, the consumption is growing too large. We talk about the footprint, meaning the resources that humanity consumes. And about uh, 20 years ago, we uh, got to a stage where we were consuming 100% of the sustainable uh, resources on the planet, and by 20 years from now, that'll go up to 200%. And that is, of course, impossible to sustain. So, so in many ways, we, you can look at humanity and say, there's a crunch coming. Every year, humankind is losing 24 billion tons of topsoil. It creates 6 million acres of new desert. It creates 160 billion tons of aqua for water, which we use up and are not replacing. It destroys vast numbers of fish in the oceans and loses 44 million acres of forest every year. And every year we're pumping 20 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And this is all destroying our environment. The planet is absolutely global and the giant problems are, are global problems which involve all the different countries. But we have no global government. And it probably is not a good idea to have a president of the planet because too much power causes people to go wrong, as we've seen in a lot of recent history. But we absolutely need global agreement about management of the issues which are going to destroy our planet. We've got to stop using coal because coal is doing unbelievable damage in many different ways. And if we did the right thing, uh, in 20 years' time, um, the dominant energy would be solar. Energy. We can make uh, solar uh, cells much cheaper and mass produce them in, in vast quantities. And the second uh, dominant energy, probably a little more than 20 years, maybe 30 years away, is, is fusion. And that probably wouldn't be fusion like the big projects, the big government projects which we have at the moment. It will be fusion from an entirely new type of design, which is much smaller, where you can have uh, private enterprise mass producing fusion units in the way they mass-produce diesel generators, and uh, this will be a very important component of the energy of the future. We're in many ways destroying the environment, the ecology of the planet, and uh, the worst thing of all is getting too much carbon into the atmosphere, which is going to change the climate. Now, if we can correct that problem, there are quite a lot of other problems left. For example, we've eaten almost all of the edible fish in the oceans, and we are have, uh, killing no end of different species. But with correct management, uh, and we know how to put that management into place. We can change so that we manage the uh, environment, manage the oceans, manage the wilderness, manage the deserts in a way where they, they come back to a healthy state. We know how to do that. In fact, it's true of so many of these things. We know how to do it, but government doesn't take any action. In fact, government, the politicians don't understand what the hell we're talking about most of the time. Rio last year, nothing happened. Copenhagen was a fiasco. All of the attempts to get uh, into country meetings to deal with something about the environment have gone wrong. Well, the answer to that is to get the solutions clearly understood and clearly taught to everybody. If you had everybody in the public asking that you stop destroying the oceans, then politicians would do something about it. So getting an understanding of what to do, putting it into very clear tutorial terms, and then getting everybody to understand it, and after the public understand it, the politicians will follow. Well, in, in fairly ordinary ways, humans are going to uh, be involving the huge changes in education. Computers are going to become just in, immensely powerful. I mean, a million times more powerful to, to, than today. We're fairly close to a time where 80% of the jobs that humans are doing today can be done better and cheaper by machines. And so this means huge change in employment is absolutely going to come. And this requires a huge amount of education. So changing humans in their talents, their capability, their uh, capability to manage complexity. Now, this is not changing humans in any drastic way. It's just getting a, a huge change based on the education that we put into place. So that's, that's relatively easy to do. 
Then beyond that, you've got the capability to change humans. We use the word transhumanism, meaning changing the body in some way, getting uh, uh, brain, the brain connected to computers and so on, possibly uh, um, changing genes. You don't want to change human genes today because we pass them on to our children. We'd probably get things wrong. And so human genetic modification is, is a, a no-no at the present time. But we can add a 24th chromosome. And that 24th chromosome will never be passed on to our children. But into that chromosome, we can put any genes that we want. And we're probably going to get large numbers of gene packs for a 24th chromosome that can't be accused of doing something irreversible because we won't be passing on to children. So there are a whole lot of things like that which are generally referred to as transhumanism, in which we're modifying the human being to uh, become a better creature than humans of today. Now this, this conference is about something above and beyond that, and, and that is uh, getting an understanding of spirituality and avatars and uh, the, the, the main substance of the conference. The Avatar Project is very complex, very futuristic, very different from what we have today. How do you make it succeed? You might possibly compare it with why was the web so incredibly successful? It started off with uh, a few person, it was really one person who invented the ideas of packet switching, and that was Len Kleinrock, and he hadn't any idea that it could possibly become big, and for a while it was just connecting computers in universities, and then it grew beyond that, and then it grew into the internet, there was a set of regulations passed where the public could use it, and then somebody uh, right out of the blue created the software for the web, and once they did that, then the public in general could participate and they could buy goods and you got the whole capability of the web growing until it was self-growing. It was take, taking off of its own accord until it grew into the fabulous thing which the web is today and it's only part of the way to its final um, destination as yet. Now that process that we're describing there did not involve government except in a few regulatory fashions. It involved very bright individuals who got dreams of the future and wanted to do things which could progress towards their dreams. Now, isn't that exactly the same as the Avatar Project? The technological uh, culture, uh, technological capability is going to keep on accelerating, accelerating and accelerating and accelerating, far beyond what the public understands. And so in order to get the public on board with these things, you've got to be asking the question, what will they gain from it? What will be the benefits from it? Why will people want it, and then try to focus on things which uh, will be good for people. I think we know that, uh, in many ways, we're on the wrong path today with the civilization that we have, and so major changes have got to be made, and we're going to have fabulous technology for uh, creating those changes. It's very important to put together a vision of what will, the world will be like 30 years, 40 years, maybe towards the end of the century. Towards mid-century or the end of the century, will we create a new renaissance? I think the answer is yes. What will it look like? It won't look like any, anything like the Renaissance of Florence. So what will be the characteristics of a 21st century Renaissance which we are capable of bringing into existence? That's a very big question. This is going to be a very interesting Congress because we're really talking about something which is an extraordinary possible future. And so to get people to understand that, they're understanding something totally new, a new option, new possibility for humankind.